I want to start with your childhood and I want to start with your story and about how you were burnt. I was burnt in a fire as a baby, as you can see. I suffered third degree burns to my face, both my hands, my left arm, the top of my head. I always wear a wig now. I am, was born into a traveller family. I'm not sure if many people know about travellers. Quite a nomadic bunch, tended to move around a lot. Not always, some of them do stay in one place. The man tended to go out to earn the money and women would usually stay at home and look after the kids in the household and things right. like this, which was true for my birth mum. But my birth mum was white, her husband was also white. So when I came out black, it put her in a difficult situation in that, you know, all the authorities at the time thought that she would be ostracized from the community, it told me different aspects of the story and it, you know, it wasn't as um, accidental as it seemed. If I've ne I was never worried about, you know, will I meet, obviously a little bit, but I wasn't worried about me in maybe being in relationships or certain things. But I was worried about work and I was also worried about ever feeling kind of free. Annie, welcome to Millennial Mind. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. I feel like I DM'd you and then I didn't hear back from you for a month and when you did I was like, yes, <laughs> I've been waiting for her. So oh. I'm really, really excited to have you here and really share your story because your story stood out to me so much and it's one that I think so many of us are gonna learn so much from too. So I'm really happy to have you here on this very hot day where it's like very humid in this room. Um, <laughs> but I wanna start with your childhood and I wanna start with your story and about how you were burnt. Yes, so, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's very nice to be here. Um, my story, let's start at the beginning. I was burnt in a fire as a baby, as you can see. I suffered third degree burns to my face, both my hands, my left arm, the top of my head. I always wear a wig now. Uh, warmer, to name a few reasons why, but it looks good too, I think. It does, I didn't even <laughs> notice actually. <laughs> I love them, I love them now. Uh, I am, was born into a traveller family. I'm not sure if many people know about travellers. Quite a nomadic bunch, tended to move around a lot. Not always, some of them do stay in one place. The man tended to go out to earn the money and women mm. would usually stay at home and look after the kids in the household and things right. like this, which was true for my birth mum. But my birth mum was white. Her husband was also white. So right. when I came out black, it put her in a difficult situation in that, you know, all the authorities at the time thought that she would be ostracized from the community <coughs> for either cheating, right? You know, we don't know exactly the reasons. Okay. So when I turned up at hospital four weeks later with burns, everyone thought that my mum had done it on purpose and tried to kill me, which, you know, isn't nice for anybody to think something mm. like that growing up. Um, I was I was pretty lucky that I was I was saved from the fire. So no one knows exa exactly how it started, but I was saved from the fire. So was you were put into a fire, or you don't know? I mean, I did an amazing documentary where I got to find out about my past. And I learned that it wasn't my mum that was there on the day of the fire, and that it was a lot to do with neglect and. <laughs> and hard, horrible stories for everybody mm. around at the time, rather than cruelty. Okay. However, as with anything, the more you learn, the more questions you have, and the more people came out and came forward to me and sort of told me different aspects of the story, and it, you know, it wasn't as um, accidental as it seemed. So I, for me personally, I've just kind of closed the book. I've got enough information as I can have very grateful for what I've got. And uh, I think it's time to just sort of close the book and move forward. Otherwise you're gonna constantly be looking back. And I've got my own things to be focusing on right now, so. So what was your youngest memory? My so you youngest were four weeks and you were taken to hospital. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? I was taken to hospital, I was in hospital for, I'd say six to seven months it was. I had a lot of wow. skin grafts, uh, a lot of so burns, you can get a lot of uh, infection, which is a lot of the reason why people die from 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 uh, scarring and things. So I had a lot of skin grafts and I had a lot of operations to try and make me look as normal as possible, if you can call it that. Right. And um, I then was a child of the state, you would call it, and I was put into care. I was fostered by a wonderful woman, Maggie, um, who six years later adopted me. So wow. I was very fortunate I was fostered into one family and then later adopted by the same family. And not a lot of other people can mm. have that. You know, most people I know 
a fostered bounce trauma system and mm-hmm. ends up, if ever, getting adopted by someone random. What's the difference between fostering and adoption? So fostering is when you're still technically a child of the state, but you're looked after uh, semi-permanently, let's say, by mm-hmm. another family or person. Okay. And then adopted is when someone becomes your legal guardian. And Got for it. intents and purposes, they are y- then your mother or father. Okay. You know, realistically, I would always call my mum Maggie who adopted me my mum. You yeah. know, I would never say my adopted mum, but for, right. you know, this purpose to make yes. it clear, I do say adopted mum. But for me, like, she's just my mum. So what was your youngest memory then of when you were younger? That is such a great question. That is such a good question. Okay, so earliest memory is probably when I was about three, I think. Wow. Yeah. Um, And it was, as most memories are, they're either really happy or really sad, usually sad. Exactly. So mine was of being on holiday in Mallorca with my mum, and she was divorced then, so she was a single mum, and she'd taken me and my older brother and sister, so three kids alone, Mm. to Mallorca, and she got me this really cheap, crappy, white, I love Mallorca hat. And I loved it. Yeah. And then I lost it. Okay. And I couldn't find it. And I was distraught. Oh, God. Yeah, that's my earliest memory. And kind of growing up in school, talk to me about your experiences. School was good, I have to kind of say. You know, I had a relatively great experience at school. I don't think any of us leave unscathed, you know? Like, we mm, all have some 100%. kind of, you know, problems, issues, difficulties, which I'm at the point now where my my eldest is gonna be starting school and I'm so nervous and it's so crazy because I know the benefits and the pluses of going through your own experiences, but now it's my time to allow him to Mm. have the same thing. I'm like, be careful. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's so crazy. But no, no, for me school was, on the whole, was pretty good. I was, um, I had a few, I think my earliest difficult uh, thing that happened uh, a girl kind of just said to me that I was no it's a boy actually a boy said something horrible to me about my face mm. and I just remember I actually just kicked him in the shin which is obviously not a very good advice but I was young it was like what pre you know like only little school right yeah. and I just remember the teacher sweeping me off and him off because obviously they couldn't condone the behavior yeah and I just remember the teachers put me in the room calling my mum in as well and they all kind of said like don't do that again. But they just said, oh, no, we're going to keep you in here for a bit because we can't let you go back to class. Right. But don't worry. Right. And it was really sweet because I do remember them being like, this isn't okay, but we're not right. angry because we get it. <laughs> so it was very clear for me then. Mm. I learned early on, like, yeah, there's a right and wrong, but don't be too moralistic on how you get there. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, when you're sticking up for yourself, that's one thing. You yeah. know, obviously, if I went and I was being horrible and I continued to be horrible, they obviously wouldn't have stood for that. But I felt very, from an early age, I was supported okay. in views. Um, and actually, this is this is one that got me hard, actually. Now, I obviously didn't remember this because it was kind of kept from me. Mm. But when I started, so this is before this incident, when I started... Um, what do you call it? Primary uh, school? Not primary school, before Reception. that. No, before that. Nursery. Like, yeah, like nursery, play school nursery. Um, I was there happy, you know, normal little kids. And I remember my mum telling me how, this is obviously after the event, but mm. a, a woman had come up to me, had gone, gone to the teacher at the time and said, oh, you know, Annie's making my daughter really unhappy. She's scared of her face and she doesn't like her scars. Can you please ask her to leave? I know. Even now, oh I just gosh. still think, like, how crazy are people like to think that they're bold enough to actually say those things? Um, unfortunately for me, obviously, the teacher said, absolutely not. Your daughter can either stay put or leave. Like, right. we're not going to remove Annie at all. Um, but it's just crazy. Do you feel like you were treated differently then? Oh, for sure, yeah. I was definitely treated differently. And still when you am, met people say. for... Th- yeah, I was just going to ask you, when you meet people for the first time... Do people feel like they can ask you questions or do they feel that they can't ask you questions? Or do you feel uncomfortable when it's somebody new and you feel like, I think so many of us feel that when you meet somebody new for the first time and somebody looks at you in a certain way, you feel that uncomfortableness. I've definitely felt it so many times before and I'm like, what are you staring at? Like, what, what, what is it? Like, what, what, why are you looking at me like that? Mm. And often I feel like so many girls are so, like we're so taught to be focused on our appearance. Mm. And when somebody meets you for the first time and they see you, you feel a little bit like anxious. I have definitely when I was younger, especially. And I remember when I was younger, I'd have insecurities around like the hair on my face and my sideburns and my mustache. So if I was sitting on this angle, 
and someone was looking at me from the side, I'd be like, oh my God. And in photos, I would have my hands like this because <laughs> I was so paranoid. But do you f did you feel that? And you just said you do, but mm. tell me about your experience when you were younger and, and um, how they still translate now. Sorry, I'm smiling just because such a sweet story. You, I think you're so attractive. When you first walked over, I was like, oh, you dream. <laughs> Honestly, I'm wearing a lot of makeup. You see I love morning. like lo you've got lovely nose. I've oh, got half a nose here, but I just love you know. So it's just so funny, isn't it? How we always think that you know we can't see ourselves. Hundred percent. How other people can see us. And also, I think another thing <laughs> I've learned with time that I'm finding more and more things unattractive about myself. Weirdly, so when I was younger, I used to hate having sideburns, so I lasered them off. Okay, that was done, and I never realised I had big teeth. I know that sounds ridiculous. Like, they're they're quite, no, no, they are. And someone like three years ago, I always thought I had perfect teeth when I was younger. You've got great teeth. Because all my friends had braces and I had straight teeth. When I was younger, I used to think, I've got perfect teeth. <laughs> As I've gotten older, someone like three years ago was like, yeah, you and your goofy teeth. And I was like, I don't have goofy teeth. And they were only saying it like in a jokey way. And now I'm like, oh my God, I do have goofy teeth. You don't have and goofy in, teeth. And when I'm smiling, I'm like, me? no, I have huge teeth. But I think as you get older, you see like the beauty standards constantly changing. Yeah. Everyone now has veneers and straight yeah. teeth. And my teeth are straight, but they're not like in a perfect line. So like so many people are getting Invisalign. And I'm like, gosh, like something that I used to love about myself when I was younger was mm. my teeth. Now I've gotten older, I drink shit loads of coffee and Diet Coke. Mm. So now they're like brown and like not in a perfect line. But it's so weird as you get older, you start yeah. to criticize yourself you almo almost more. But I totally understand that one. You do criticize yourself so much more. Yeah. Um, can I just say your teeth are actually fabulous and very nice. <laughs> and I've actually got a bit of a thing about like, I think that you can have, cause I've actually got uh, veneers of front four, but I, I don't think they should be too perfect. I always don't look quite. Some I think you need like to so perfect. Yeah, it's too and much. they're so white, and you're yeah, almost like yeah, yeah. I'm you like kind of want to get like yeah. in between. Maybe I think that's probably the look. Yeah. If you well, you know what? Each if you want to get tips, go. I mean, I know. How's this happen? We're like dead <laughs> here, guys. If you want to understand, no, but realistically, we say this, we'll probably change again. Won't we? Exactly. We want something different, but no. Okay, so yeah, how did I deal with that? I'm not even gonna lie and say that I didn't. Um, that it was okay because it wasn't. I felt really, I think from a young age, I found it really difficult in that I would almost brace myself for meeting people new, as in I wouldn't right. look at them directly. I would look kind of down to let mm. them look and then I would look up and smile. Not like really obviously, but yeah. kind of more like be distracted and then look towards them. Because people would react so harshly, it would really, really? hurt my feelings, yeah. And I think, I think that if I, you know, went in guns blazing with people, I would just, be on the floor like I would yeah it would just be too much to take because people can and then even with that people will still have crazy reactions and the things that people used to say um I don't know what it is about my face I think that it kind of one thing is and it could be a plus in some aspects that when people see me maybe briefly once or a picture of me or or at some point and bear in mind I'm not talking about now I'm talking about back then I think people feel like they see me more than once because it imprints almost in their head so that, right. that kind of drops the barrier and they kind of feel like they can ask or say or anything. Mm. Um, my mum used to make a joke and say, like, you really bring out the crazy in people. It's like, I think because I kind of bring them closer to the blo bone, you know? Right. And they, br you know, I kind of drop their, I kind of bring out the human in them. I kind of br bring out a reaction out of them and then they could feel like they can ask or do or say whatever they want. And some of the crazy things that people have done and said is just literally, my, like, it still blows my mind some of the things that people do. Um, like what? If you don't mind sharing. Oh. I mean, when I was younger, just I think everything really. Like there would the comments they would say, the questions they would ask, the things they would stop me. They would try and take pictures of me. Um, I've been followed like four times, and I'm not just talking like mm. up the road. I'm talking like Gosh. for miles. I was attacked. Um, all kinds of why crazy. Just oh, I don't know. I didn't, didn't stop to ask. Like, <laughs> sorry, sorry, one second. Sorry, guys. Can we just can clarify we <laughs> on a poll from one to three? What are we up, what are we down for here today? What are we up for? No, That's like me. <laughs> I'd be like, uh, can you just tell me why you're yeah, doing that? What the hell? No. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just it's just so strange. Like some of the things people do and say. Um, and I, yeah, as I say, I, I think I sort of learned how to brace myself against people a okay. little bit from a young age. And it's really fun that you should speak about that because it's really this last week or so I've been thinking about that because the things that I was sort of doing now and up to, there was a point in my life, I've ne I was never worried about, you know, will I meet, obviously a little bit, but I wasn't worried about mm. meeting, maybe being in relationships or certain things. But I was worried about work and I was also worried about ever feeling kind of free, you know? 
Okay. Like I kind of wanted to be famous when I was young. I thought if I could be famous and I could tell everyone what happened, yeah. no one ever asked me again and then I could just live a normal life. Right. But that's very like a ten, I was 10 when I kind of thought that. Mm. And as I got older, obviously, I was the opposite of what I wanted to be. I didn't want to be in, ever in the public eye, if you like, because I thought I'd just get more questions, which is true, I do. Um, but actually, I say the last few years, without me knowing, you know, these sort of things aren't the issue. But that's how life goes, you know. You always think something's a really big issue, but as life unfolds, you realise what's important and what's not. Mm. And I think probably one of the best blessings of being different and having a difficult time is it really sort of makes you a bit more conscious to what's important, you know? It gives you a bit more clarity. Well, that's a very wise and mature outlook, I think, on life. I think when you're younger, you don't know what's important. You know, when I was younger, I used to just think, you know, making sure that I looked nice and making sure that I was good in school and making sure that I had a boyfriend or, you know, making sure I had friends was like the most important thing. Mm. I didn't really have a purpose, you know, when you're mm. like six or seven, you don't care, you just care about being popular in school and eating good food. That's what I cared about anyway. Well, yeah. Um, when was the first time I think you remember recognizing yourself and saying like, I don't look the same as your siblings, for example? Like everything, you know, I think in the media, in film, TV, how mm. everything's explained is always this kind of one hit wonder this yes. one defining moment and it's just not like that mm. Every, like everything it comes in waves and it it's these loads of little events that kind of all stack up and add up but speaking of one of them oh, there's so many i do remember one specific one at school it's only popped in my head now when you asked earlier i didn't even think of this but i remember coming downstairs into the assembly and this was infants and the mm. assembly you where you walk down was in front of everyone so the whole school looks at you right. and i remember everybody was staring at me and i genuinely didn't know why. I was like, why is everyone staring at me? Didn't it didn't yeah. because for me, although I was different, I just thought we are all different. Yeah. You've got long hair, I've got short hair, you're a boy, yeah. I'm a girl, someone's tall, someone's short, I've got nine fingers, you've got ten. Why? I've got burns, you've got blonde hair. You know what I mean? It, to me, I just got thought it. we've all different. I thought it was semi normal to be burnt in a way. Mm. Um so I do remember specifically like Oh, okay, that's interesting. Mm. And then again, I do remember having a conversation once about my mum. I was quite sad. I remember crying on the sofa. Mm. This is probably the only time I genuinely cried about my own situation in that kind of sad way, mm. which I know sounds like I'm being bold. I'm not at all. It's no. just, it's just the one because if we're on, honest about things, we don't really cry when we know there's not much we can do about it. We cry when we our hair feels like crap or we look rubbish or we got to go out we don't want to we cry about things that are in, we s perceive as injustice but we don't we know that they're not you know we don't cry right. about the big things i disagree with you on that i think you're really strong because to say that because i think there's so many people that cry about things that they can't change and i think the reason why is they don't want to accept personal responsibility yeah and people, I listen to this in so many podcasts, but people, when you say to them, it's your responsibility, it's almost like, oh my God, you've attacked me. Yeah. Right? Like what you've just said is we don't really cry. It's, it, you shouldn't. No. If, if you cannot change a situation and there's nothing you can do about it, it's okay to feel upset and low sometimes and on certain days absorb that pain and feel that feeling. But to cry every single day about mm. something you cannot change and to just complain and like wither away mm. and just say like, this is awful is never gonna change anything, no. right? No. But loads of people I don't think do that. I think mm. loads of people don't accept that personal responsibility of, I can't change it, this has happened. They're just like, this is unfair, why has it happened to me? This is cruel, why does God work in this way? I hear you. Okay, so I do understand what you mean and you are right, people do tend to do that. I was definitely talking about me. Sometimes I say yeah. we because I find I find it. I do find it hard to sort of say I was strong in this area because mm. I, I, it immediately g does exactly what you just did. Everyone else feels attacked. If I speak yeah. my truth, everyone else then goes, "Oh, just because you're just strong, cause you're just because you're this, you're strong." Mm. So sometimes I will, the way I were things, and I should be yeah. more direct. So yeah, that is ex that you is should true. own that, and that's great that you that <clears throat> you're personally strong in certain areas because we all have our strengths. Mm. And if you're strong in one one area, someone may not be, but there's probably areas you're in. I hundred percent agree in. with that. That sentence is is so true. But I think for me, it's again, I can be cheeky. We were talking about Instagram earlier, previous to this sort of mm. recording. But I, for a slightly easier life, I don't always go out and say the big lines because again, this is one of the things that people forget is that they'll will say, oh, "Annie, come on, you know, 
push yourself forward, do this more. And I'm like, I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I'm still a person living a life. I don't want to mm -hmm. have to wave the flag, make a statement every five minutes. Call me old fashioned, but sometimes I just want to go for a dinner <laughs> and have dinner and shoot the shit and talk about the weather. I don't always want to, you know, so yeah, I do tend say to- Say something Yeah, I do sometimes just say things just to, to let the let the ball keep rolling rather than putting a stopper on it. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so going back to, where were we? I can't remember now. Oh, oh crying, yeah. So yeah, crying. so my mum, I was crying. I remember being exhausted and I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to have to always do this, always be on and always have to talk to people and always have, you know, stopped my day. Someone coming up to me, all this. But this was at a point when I was younger, I was high on emotion, I was probably about 14, 15. Like, right. you know, you're just crazy on that. And yeah. as you say, you're very self-absorbed. And that's not in a bad way, it's just that's just how you operate at that age. Mm. Again, emotions are high. Um, and you just sort of learn your first bits of independence at that age as well. Yeah. And so really feeling the weight of going, I can't cry to my mum here. And my mum, very well, really, she just sat there and kind of let me cry and she said, there's nothing I can do, uh, ultimately. But there's no, there wasn't any, there was no words of comfort for that. There was just, mm. I can sit with you, but this is your lot. And yeah. actually, I do think that whilst I didn't love that, I, you know, I think I wanted, I wanted someone to wave a magic wand and make it okay. But ultimately, that's not how it works. And I think that's actually what's missing nowadays. I think that there's this really scary thing that's happening where, yes, it's awesome. We're all talking, these, having these conversations. Like the fact that I'm sitting here on your sofa, the fact that I've been able to do documentary, the fact that I've, you know, I've been welcomed into different arenas is amazing because I know I wouldn't have been like 10, 20, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. But the back, you know, the double-edged sword of that seems to be also that we're too, you know, pseudo kindness. Yeah, yeah, you're, 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 all your emotions are valid. You should be, yes, my emotion, for instance, on that day was valid. I'm allowed to be sad because that situation is hard and scary and no one knows what to do. Mm. It doesn't mean it's right, you know? Do you see what I mean? The difference there, like people kind of think every emotion is valid. It's like, no, there are your emotions, but it doesn't mean that you need to act on them. You know, like, again, this goes yeah. on to my next thing that kind of happened for me is I remember all my friends were getting jobs in like shops, like H&M, Topshop, all these kind of clothes shops. And I wanted to as well, I wanted to earn some money and some mm. cash. So I sent my CV out, walked my CV into, and whenever I walked my CV in, or whenever I did get the interview and got to go to the shop, the TV, you know, the sorry, the, the TV, the cashier person would be like, look at me, like, and face would drop. She'd get awkward, I'd get awkward. I got n nothing, not call back. Everyone said that the jobs were full. Now I knew that it wasn't because a lot of my friends were working and they said they've got loads of space and need to fill them. So I knew that they didn't want to hire me based on how I looked. And I just, and that, that absolute, that really upset me because I just thought, God, you know, if I can't get a job in a shop, which I didn't even really desperately want that much at the time, I was like, what else can I do? And as you know, mm -hmm. thoughts don't just stay neutral. You know, they're always gonna grow, either yeah. positively or negatively, they're gonna develop. And so for me, it kind of just spiraled into, oh, what else can I do? And I felt low and I thought it made me feel like I didn't have independence and I'd always have to rely on people. And I thought, if, you know, if I can't do this, and it just kept kind of growing and growing. And that's when I had that, coming back to what you just said about responsibility, and that's when I had the kind of the, the realization more, so I wouldn't say the first time, but more so around then that, you know, no matter how, fair something is or how right something is or whose fault it is or what the circumstances this is my story you know this is my responsibility and I'm gonna have to deal with it mm. and you know I know a lot of people want to say it's sad and but for me that was ultimately I'd say pretty freeing it wasn't great it wasn't what I want to hear but it was what I needed to hear right. I think we always downplay that those moments where you need to sit on your own and wrestle with your thoughts yes and be on your butt and struggle mm. they're the moments that you know you can't buy that they're the moments that teach you how to live and mm -hmm. who you want to be mm. and that really is worth everything and that kind of lays a foundation for me going forward. And I look back now and that taught me what self-care was. I would never have coined it for that, of course. But that really showed me what self-care is in that now I can make decisions right. based on what really matters. Because mm. I know if I lose that sense of self, when people are mean, as they do sometimes, when things go wrong, not mm -hmm. just with around my scars on my face, but in all areas, mm -hmm. I know that I can handle it if, 
I'm making decisions based on what I like already, if I'm living well, if I'm yeah. full of confidence, if I'm feeling my best. Mm. But if I'm distracted, if I'm putting out all my energy into random people and random things, doing a job that I'm not passionate about, I don't have my rocks to lean on if things mm. go wrong. You know what I mean? So I to say, like, yeah, it's not great that I was burnt in, in situations like this, but, you know, there's, there is pluses to, to being in pain. Absolutely. Well, when you were younger, talk to me about, I'm really intrigued. So you applied for all those jobs, you didn't get any. Mm. What did you do? You said you had that mo those moments of self-care. But how did you really reprogram your mind to be like, right, I'm going to do something about this? And how did you do something about it? How, what was your journey after that? As again, I always like to say this, because I think that often when people do talks, podcasts, now obviously it's not necessarily so much me, but a lot of like the big dogs out there that are, smashing life and doing really well in different arenas they really always tell their story and usually that's either exception to the rule or winner's bias and whilst right. it is fascinating we do want to understand it realistically they're probably there or where they are in spite of what they've been through not because of what they've been through yeah so the reason why i'm making that a point is because i don't like it when people hear these one hit wonder things and they think oh yeah that's what i need to do it's not it's a series of really 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 small steps that add up and that is where the huge impact comes on the rest of your life so for me I didn't act well. I was, you know, teen when this happens. So what did I do? Drinking with my pals because it's so much fun. Now, that's not drinking in desperation like I'm a borderline addict. I'm just talking... Right. Having fun like every 17-year-old. What do you do as a 17-year-old yeah. if things don't go your way? You're not yeah. going to go, I'm going to make some great decisions. Like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to party because that's way more fun <laughs> No one is thinking like, about my issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go, you yeah. know, discover my thoughts. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know what I could do. Relinquish responsibility <laughs> and go and forget myself. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, so that's... What I did basically just did other things. My friends were like managers of Pizza Hut, so I just you know what does anyone do? Get your pal to hire you. Yeah, that's the only person that's going to hire you, isn't it? Really, yeah. <laughs> Keep the friends close, guys. Um, and then I just did things that I enjoyed. But again, that did help me. Looking back, mm. I found out what I liked because I didn't do things that I didn't like. I did just things that I enjoyed because I needed to have that joy in my life. Wow. You know, I couldn't rely on the outside world, which I think is the opposite is true now. I think a lot of people. In, you know, look for external happiness and not intrinsic. Whereas I was fortunate, I actually had to find inner happiness um, in the that. things I liked. And for me, I did things which I liked, which included being with my pals, sports, movement, physical activity, right. looking after myself with food. You know, like for me, I really got to fall into things that immediately helped me feel good and helped me long term. Right. So I keep looking down. So I'm thinking, I'm like looking back. It's like, honestly, it's I'm, you so know, fun. I'm literally mum life now, running around, <laughs> work, sorting out everything. And so I'm literally thinking of things I haven't thought about That's in good. so long. It is good. That's nice. It's really nice. It's very nice. So, you know, the way you're speaking to me, the way, kind of the, the journey that you're describing, describing to me, mm -hmm. I think it's quite rare to, to hear it because I'm hearing that you had a lot of self-love for yourself quite early on. And if I compare that to me mm -hmm. and I think about... When I was younger, I don't think I had any self-love for myself. I think I was someone who was really insecure about the way I looked. I was really insecure about the way I, where I was ranked, I guess, in school, because you had like all these rankings, like in class, you had like one, two, two A, two B, and I was in two A, and then I got moved on to four B in maths. It was just a disaster. But I was never like the cleverest girl in school. You know, I, I got by, I was fine. Um, and I was never, you know, the prettiest girl and I wasn't the most popular either. So I never felt like I had any of the attributes to feel loved or comfortable. Mm. Um, that changed a lot when I got older and I kind of worked on myself a little bit more. And I went. Well, when you say got older, when. What I would say mean? when I got to uni. Right. I was a lot was more confident. 20, when I was like 21, 18, 18, 19. 19 kind of Growing up, I didn't have a lot of confidence. I wasn't someone who was like, you know, really like, a, you know, I just didn't have a lot of confidence. I was quite. Um, I, wasn't say, I wouldn't say I was like really unhappy and I was like, I really, no, I understand. You know what I, mean? I really but understand. I didn't have a lot of self love and I wasn't strong and I was always really opinionated. So that didn't help. And I was always told, like, don't say that. Don't say these things. You know, you, sh you should be a, be in a certain way. I was Who very that? a pigeonholed a lot by that? family, friends, and people within my community. Really? I still think growing up I was as well. Like there's so many times I've said stuff and people have been like, "Can you just don't don't really say that in front of these kind of people?" Really? You know, or like don't really come across sometimes like you're so independent. People say that to me still. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I get it all the time, and I think within an Indian culture. 
I speak only from my personal experience because people have attacked me being like, that's not for all Indians. But from my own experience, I think within an Indian culture, I have been told to like tame down a little bit. I've been told that like by being so opinionated and saying certain things that I won't find somebody or I won't, um, you know, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, that said a lot, by the way, in Indian culture, what would your mother and father-in-law say? When I started modeling, that was the first question that was asked to me. What if your mother and father-in-law don't like it? I was like, well, I don't have a mother and father-in-law. I, like, <laughs> I was like 19. I was like, well, if they don't like it, then they don't like it. Like, what do you want me to say? Anyway, my point is, growing uh, up, I wasn't that confident. So good. But hearing from you, you sounded like you were really confident. And oh, how did sorry. you start to really go on that journey? And, and what do you do now as well? That's such a great question. First of all, I'm going to have to say, if you're opinionated and you're able to be yourself enough for people to try and squash it, mm -hmm. that does indicate to me that you were way more confident than you think you were. That's true. And you've got to remember as well, confidence is one of those things that always looks more on the outside. It's same as courage mm -hmm. or bravery. It doesn't feel like courage and bravery. It's just, no, it's just how, how it's perceived by the people. And I think for me, a lot of the time is that I've been blessed with a very short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally just want to have a relatively relatively good time and do the things that I like to do. And that means that I'm going to always be gravitate towards people that are kind, fun, mm. things like this. And also that I'm very enthusiastic. And I think that enthusiasm is so closely linked to confidence that yeah. it can... So I think a lot of people think I'm really, really confident. And in actual fact, I'm just... I love people, so I'm excited when I meet people. I don't, I don't, you know, what you were talking about earlier, or yes, although I may be nervous of how people might perceive me, but ultimately I care more about who I'm going to meet, what we're right. going to chat about, and if I don't like them, that's okay, or if they don't like me, that's okay too, because I don't like everyone. Yeah. That's totally cool. Do you know what I mean? I never had that hang up, even with boys and yeah. stuff when I was younger. I remember all my friends were like, oh my God, what if he doesn't like me? I was like, what if you don't like him, man? Like there's that's so many I'm fish like in the now. sea. Like, but not in a, even in a horrible way. Like for me, I was always like the law of numbers. There has got to be someone oh out there my God. that is going to like you and that you're going to like, you know, it'd be yeah. more impressive if you didn't than you did. Like, it's just it's like, so don't silly. worry about it. It's just, I used to think, you know, when you're only going to live once, you only got so much free time. <laughs> Would it be that bad if you were single for a long time and you could just do your own thing? Like, I'm so harsh on. like that. When my friends break up, when like people get broken up with, and they're like so upset about it. I'm like, there's Come seven on. billion people yeah. in the world. Come on now. And like, I don't know why I've had this like confidence that I don't really, I'm not worried. Like uh, I, if, I, if, I, if, if, if I break up with somebody, I'm just like, yeah, it's sad for a bit, but like I will find someone else. Yeah. It's not a big deal. And I don't mean to say that in a horrible no, way. Like, I get you. I love my boyfriend loads. You. If you're watching this, I love you loads, I'm sorry. But what I mean is like, I don't think your life should end. No based on somebody else. No. And I think that's what I mean by like that self-love and confidence is grown up, I've grown up now mm. and I feel like I have a lot more. Mm. But you're right in terms yeah. of enthusiasm because people are like, you're so confident in your podcast. And I'm like, it's just I'm passionate about the passionate issue. about what you're doing and you enjoy what you're doing, yeah. Okay, so that's a big one for the confidence. I think that you're talking about, I will agree with you about school and things like that. I'm gonna be honest, I was very fortunate. I had such an amazing group of friends. Yeah. Um, and we got a lot of attention as a group, I think. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I didn't feel like I was less than because I was within that mm. arena. Um, and I just had so much fun at school. Did you? Yeah, I really did. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I knew I could be smarter, but then mm. everyone would tell me, oh, you know, you're not that, everyone kind of imposed that I wasn't that smart. But actually I did quite good, you know, relatively well. Mm. And I wish I'd l not listened. And I, you know, cause I didn't work as hard because I thought, you know, everyone said, said that my attention wasn't great, you know, so they always, right. Im imply um but now I, I just really had a good time at school i love sports i uh I, I just wasn't i just wasn't that way people weren't that incredibly rude and if they were i was bold enough to say what are you doing like i even remember my first my first I was year seven so that's the first year of secondary school and i remember a girl in year 11 so that's mm. the top end basically we're telling everyone that my mum who's my adopted mum had chucked a chip pan like oil over me and so I was annoyed because I was like how dare you speak about my mum in that manner you know like I was, as you would and remember as well at that age you're like yeah. I was I was like high octane emotion at that age so like even now people think I'm I'm like I was nothing compared to as a kid like I was a rock wallet like Arr! if you said something about you know so and I just remember going into her form mm. be like what and I just called right in front of everyone and said what the hell don't ever say that to me again da -da -da -da. um 
I think again, I think it's just to do with attention and what I was focusing on. I didn't, I, I just wasn't super worried about other people when right. I was younger. I think that helped. As I said, I had great friends and they were all very similar. I didn't have that many friends that were quiet. They were all very loud, every single one, very loud, very boisterous, right. very opinionated, you know. So I felt like we were always in our own little bubble. It mm. wasn't like us against them or anything. It was just like we Got were it. always just enjoying school and, and doing our own thing. Um, I think, again, I'm sorry, I'm going around in circles because I, I, I don't want to lie and say that it was like a natural thing where I worked at it because I don't want people to think, A, it was natural because it wasn't because it was mm. peaks and troughs. And two, I didn't intentionally work at it, but I was smart enough to know to lean into things that brought me, you know, closer to contentment, joy and move away from things that didn't. You know, like there's certain people and certain friends that I gravitated towards and certain people I didn't. I didn't love being with people that were maybe quieter and only talking about boys in school. Mm. I wanted to be with people that were having fun and running around and doing stuff. Right, okay. You know, so I think that it was it was that kind of vibe. Also, I was young, one of, where are you in the pecking order in your family? I'm the oldest. Yeah, so I've always got this thing with this as well. So the oldest, is you're the first one out of the box. You're a bit more, although you have a lot of confidence, it brings with it that awareness of other people, because your, your peers are really adults. Yes. Whereas for me, I was the third one. No one cares about the third one. <laughs> I'm like lucky if I got, do you know what I mean? I was just like random, chucked in there. So <laughs> yeah. I didn't have that need to be heard. I, you know, I was just so used to the carnage and the chaos. And that, I think mm. that brings a lot of confidence being the third because you're so used to mucking in. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of attributes that again, yeah. successful people always make out like they're the one and only and they did something different, they did something better. But it's like, if you find out, ten, you tend to find out where they are in the pecking order, where they are grown up, what areas they grew up, the you know the values of their parents you kind of see how it all kind of makes sense and again I was very lucky with my mum like she didn't entertain things that weren't important herself like she was very I would say she's quite stoic in a way but also really joyful like she would laugh at problems you know wow. like I even I was telling someone another this podcast I was telling someone about a story that I remember crying to her about a boyfriend I'd basically done something silly and got myself into trouble and I was crying. I was like, oh, oh. She, and she literally just said, <laughs> and she called to my stepdad and was like, listen to this. And he's done blah, 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 you know, X, Y, Z. And she was laughing. I was like, mom, I'm going through trauma here. Like, come on, this is so sad. Yeah. She's like, Annie, how have you got yourself in another problem with, you know, like what are you? And she just thought it was hilarious. You know what I mean? Like it was always yeah. very jest. Like she would always pull the joke out of things. And, right. and she was always very like, get on with it. Do, you, do your own thing. Um, like force me into responsibility. Like mm. I'd even say sometimes, I don't want to be said, I don't want to do that. She'd be like, go, either you don't, if you don't do it, you're not going to get it. You know what I mean? Like, why? Yeah. So, so it instilled that confidence within you. Yeah. So I think that, um, the, the, and I know that sounds like I'm going off tangent. I'm not. What I'm trying to explain is like the ambience, if you like, the vibe get it. of my household. Yes. Wasn't, I wasn't allowed to be in the, you know, if I brought home those issues that weren't that relevant. Yeah, or be like, why are you upset? What are you doing? If you've got time to moan, come and do the chores. Yeah. If you're that, you know, you know what I mean? If you're gonna yeah. stare at a brick wall, come and do the washing up. Yeah. So it was very that. like, yeah, it, you know, I can I can say that I had excellent friends, excellent family. Mm. I'm not discounting myself because I do know that I did work. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I think that I, I learned very early the importance of what self care is. Wouldn't have coined it at that, okay. but I understood that you must look after yourself. And it's not what you do in the moments of sadness, it's what you do all of the time around all events, you know? So it's mm. what you're eating, what you're drinking, how you're sleeping, you know, that's gonna impact how you show up, how you feel. And what do you do now for self-care? Self-care for me is just, I always say on my Instagram, like I literally, I hope, I, I, I want people to go on my Instagram and be like, I'm sick and tired of you banging on about the small steps add up. Because it's true. There's one yeah. thing I could sort of part with people because I always want the confidence magic or the snap or how do you do this or how do you overcome this, that and the other. It's not so much about that one thing. It's about all these small things that you do mm. that allow you to A, feel good because mm. I think that whatever way you cut it, it's either physical or mental, chicken or egg, either way around. If you start walking in fresh air, if you have a good night's sleep, eat some good food, mm. your problems will look so much better. And if you're in a really good mood, they will look like challenges. Right. If you're in an even better mood, they'll look like something fun that you can attack and you can align it with passion and mm. that can be something you wanna do. I think that people always think that 
when you've gone through a difficult time, there's this one thing that you need to go and sit with a psychologist and maybe speak, and then suddenly you can unwrap it in a few sessions. It just does not work like that. Like when you're looking after yourself and you're relaxed yeah. and you're slept and you're uh, calm, that's when you can sit in quiet and then these things can come up and you mm. can go, you know what? And you can question the thoughts and you can say, hey, how's that gonna work? If you have a routine that's set up, you don't need to run on motivation. You don't need to be thrown off course when a big challenge comes in because you've got these rocks that you can lean on. Right. So I think when people want to kind of improve their life or maybe shield themselves against things that are difficult, it's showing up in the difficult things. Because yes, mm. maybe a workout isn't gonna change your day. But if you show up, it's hard. It's hard to show up for a workout most of the time, not every day, but most of the time, two mm. times a week if that's all you can do. Saying to yourself consciously, like, oh, I'm gonna do this hard thing. If you can do the hard thing in a small time, mm. your brain, you're telling yourself, yeah, I can kind of do the hard thing when something big comes up. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think now we're always kind of pushing people to say, you're worthy, you're enough, you're this. But it's like, yeah, you say that, but then we've got also got a massive problem with people with low confidence and low self-esteem. Mm. Yes, you are enough. That doesn't mean you can't work on yourself. And one of the best ways yes. to boost confidence is doing something hard. And how can you do something hard all the time? You can't. So picking up a workout is a very safe way to practice those hard things. You talk about fitness so passionately, and I'm so curious how you went from working in Pizza Hut to starting <laughs> the Wild Women Club. Oh, okay, so very briefly, I did work in Pizza Hut, absolutely loved it. I was absolutely horrendous at it. I was terrible, always <laughs> getting in trouble, playing volleyball over the counter and just being an absolute liability. But that's where your friends hire you, so you can do, you can <laughs> get away a bit, to, you know, until you get found out by the owner, then you get kicked out. Um, but I then got a job as a personal trainer. I was always into sports. I did sports right. all through my life. I was always in and out of the gym anyway, doing conditioning to help support the sports. So I decided to work for myself because I told you before I had tr trouble getting a job. Mm. I thought if I work for myself, I won't ever have to ask other people to hire me and I won't have to give up that. You know, it hurts if people mm. say no. So I just thought if I have that responsibility, it's all on me. And I, and I love that. I love that sort of, that feeling. So yeah, I worked as a personal trainer um, I used to rent gyms in London and wow. then I moved out of London and I helped my husband and another business partner build a gym in Cobham. And then I left there and I did some documentaries and I, but I've always done online training as well because I absolutely love it. And then now I've decided after lockdown, I realized the value in it. Cause I think I felt that disconnect. I wasn't sure if it would work across, you know, I love being with people, you know, so I kind of was sad about it. But then as I say, over lockdown, I realized the benefit and how much mm. impact it, you can give. And in reality, it's not the information, you know, it's not taking someone through the workouts. It's more the support that you can give. It's the behavior, it's the help, mm. the challenges, it's help getting the, the habits to stick. Right. So I built Well Women Club originally because I wanted to raise money for charity for the Casey Piper Foundation and Action for Children, two charities that hold very dear to my heart and I think have changed the world in many uh, positive ways. Just <clears throat> to touch on those charities, what, why are they so dear to your heart? Uh, Katie by Foundation have really, really helped me to do with my scars and I, I would say literally on the ground self-care towards my scars. I've had a lot better operations since speaking with them. Not that they've done them specifically, but they've mm. helped point me in the right direction. They right. helped me with my hair, my wigs. Wow. And again, I was really struggling. I was having the worst horrible hair that literally caused my scalp to bleed. It was <gasps> horrendous. And so they just really sort of supported me there. Action and children, because they really look after kids in in, in difficult situations. Mm. They don't just help the kids, but they help the families, the mums. They now do Parent Talk, which is a wonderful um, uh, free resource that you can text people in to ask. And this is not just random people, this is parent uh, coaches mm. uh, for advice. And I love this because I think that, again, support is always right at the end. Mm. When really, I don't want people to get there. I want people to, I want there to be more support before people get to the, right. on the floor. Yeah. So yeah, I wanted to support them. And after lockdown, they did, like all of the charities, they lost so much money because people weren't be able to do the events and everything. And it really sort of uh, drilled me, put me into the floor. I think mm. that that really hurt. I was just really sad about that whole situation. And um, so I decided rather than just say to people, give me cash, I said, look, I'm gonna give you free, free eight weeks of training. I'm gonna give workouts 
uh, food. I'm going to do interviews with psychologists, mm. all for free. I would love a donation. I want to raise fifty thousand pounds for charities and split between the two. However, three weeks into this three week training, I actually had a twist in my um, my tummy and I actually nearly died. And I ended up in hospital. Um, oh my god! Yeah, I was in hospital for two weeks. It's horrendous. Um, so I couldn't actually complete it, but I raised thirteen thousand pounds. So I was really please consider and I did that from from you know over a few weeks of of doing it but then after that I still did lots of bo bits and bobs with it still obviously having loads of people asking me about training I've been a personal trainer for ugh, nearly 15 years now given wow. my age so I yeah I'm continuing well with the club and I want to help people with the basics mm. but actually mm. doing it because I think there's that massive disconnect right now especially with social media you're either I want to be on a fat loss I want to yeah. be lean or it's I don't care I don't need to I don't yeah. need to do anything and it's like no no, no what's happened where the hell have we gone right where we don't just say I want to be healthy right. now don't get me wrong I love changing shape I love losing weight I yeah. love gaining weight I love changing right. my body shape getting a bigger butt smaller butt it's all yeah. really fun you can totally enjoy those bits as well as are you doing the basics you know right. are you walking enough are you doing um eating the right foods and I think yeah. that there's a lot of information out there and people have got lost and it's either dieting or not diet. So I think that it'd be really good to, for people to understand the basics, to feel right. good. Going back to what you just asked me, I get so many questions on how to be confident, how to be able to focus, how to get over the difficult times in their life. And mm. I said that it's not, it's, not like, it's not those one key words. It's about Habits. if you look after yourself, you will feel better and then you can do better. Definitely. You know, so it doesn't just affect us being positive. It affects mm. every single person around us. You're more likely to be kinder, to look after your mm. fellow neighbour. So for me, it really isn't just about, oh, I want to, you know, lift mm. weights. It's about the massive impact that it does. And you've got a course coming up now, right? I have a course, another course coming up. So this is my fourth, fifth, sixth intake. So Wellwood Club coaching, hybrid coaching. So you're going to get the benefit of a one-to-one -one okay. with me. Right. Coaching in the group scenario. It starts in June 13th, jump in. I also do one-to-one. -one. I love it, this is my bag. If you wanna do Bad. it, workouts, food, mood. If you wanna do health, mm. gain weight, change your shape, lose weight, shoot me a message. I'll put all the links in the description. Hit it. Do you still speak to your birth mom? Mm. And do you have any resentment or ill feeling about what happened? I don't speak to my birth mom because she died when I was seven. Oh, wow. I don't have Ill, Ill feeling towards her, no. She, um, the more I found out about my mum, mm. I realised that she, and also as you grow up, and I've had my own kids now, and I can imagine mm. some of it, she had such a hard life. And I don't mean that, I have to say it now because of Instagram and how everyone thinks everything's hard, but she was, you know, a beaten up, abused, hor horrible things, mm. hard, difficult life limited support mm. no one could help because they don't really no one knows how to help really in certain situations and so it was just like a sad story to another sad story to another sad story like right she did with the best she could i think i believe that i think That's you're enough. just so strong and you're so positive you i think there's nice. so many people now who have been through difficult times and i, I read the book the art of happiness have you read it by dalai lama oh yes i have that actually yeah and there's a chapter in there and uh, this woman loses her son, I think, or somebody that she loves, I think it's her son. And she says to the Dalai Lama, please bring him back. And the Dalai Lama's like, I will bring back your son if you can find me one household that hasn't lost anyone or hasn't experienced any pain. And every time I think about that, and obviously she couldn't find a household that hadn't experienced any pain, because all of us experience pain. And every time I think about that, and I feel like I'm feeling sorry for myself, or I'm finding things hard. And look, life is hard. Everybody's gonna lose someone they love. Mm. Everyone's gonna go through some trauma. Mm -hmm. Everyone's gonna go through a situation that they feel like they cannot get out of. Mm. But in that moment, you have to decide about how you want to uh, live the rest of your life. Mm. Because you cannot hold on to all the bad things that have happened mm -mm. to you. And I hate it when people say, why me? 
because nobody deserves anything. Nobody deserves anything. When when somebody says when they've lost somebody, they say, "Why did this happen to me?" I know. Well, who did you want it to happen to? <laughs> oh my god, that's such a good line. I haven't heard that actually. Who did you want it to happen? Who did you to? want it? Honestly, like. Oh my god, I how have really I lived my whole life without <laughs> hearing that? I feel really insensitive when I have that thought, but I find it really frustrating when, and, and I get it. You know, when, when you're got, if you're struggling through a disease or cancer or something that you feel like it's it wasn't you eat well let's say for example and you've been really healthy you've never smoked you've never eaten fried food whatever it is and that happens to you you think why me but so many people could say that and when I ever think about and it's really easy for me to say now because nothing traumatic has happened to me right at this specific moment if I lost somebody I'm sure I'd be like this is so unfair like I can't believe I've lost them but it always makes me think back now to thinking that after hearing that story and reading that book everyone goes through pain mm. everyone goes through really hard times and mm. Some people's are much harder than others, but pain is still relative to that person. Mm. So if you've been through something traumatic, I may think that my pencil breaking that day when I'm a three-year-old child is traumatic. Obviously what we were talking about before, it's about having perspective, mm. but generally people think what's happened to them is the most important I know, I know. thing. I find that strange. I think there's two things at play here. One, like when you feel something and your emotions come up, they're real. That is yes. true. Like what you just said, it's true for everyone. Everything is, from your own level of perception, how you experience it is true for you, and that is real. There's no denying that one person's pain is is another person's pain true. Mm. That is all true. However, we must, all of us must remember that how we feel isn't always true. You know, you don't, mm. no one owns the monopoly on pain. Yes. You know, no, it does, it's, it's not helpful for you, for anybody. Like, for instance, let me think, like, as you say, a breakup. Imagine if you said to your boss, oh my God, you know, I need a mental health day because I broke up with my boyfriend, which is kind of going around the internet now. Like we're yeah. saying that, that we should that should be a thing, that we should be allowed to do that. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's a great thing. Let's just say that we will do that. Now let's have this scenario. We have a heart surgeon. Now the person you love the most in your life, either a parent, your boyfriend, your mum, your yeah. cat, whatever likes your boat, is on, the, on that, <laughs> whatever, whatever works for you, is on that hospital bed. And that's her and who you know would definitely be able to save your mum or the cat <laughs> will be able to help you. And he goes, you know what? I need a mental health day. I'll be back. Mm. You're going to have to use one of the other surgeons that may or may not help. You know what I mean? It's just mm. all very... I just think that there's a wave at the moment that's just not helpful. It's almost like we're infantilizing, I don't know how to say that word, to everybody. Right. We're all adults now. You know, We must support each other in that. You're allowed to say, I hear you, I understand... There, there's probably going to be another way for you to look at that in a few more days, moments, hours, days, years, whatever. Right. You know, like I think that this whole thing where you say, yeah, that guy's, you know, got no legs, but I've broken my leg. I'm still allowed to be sad about my leg. That's yes. true, but yes. there's a big but here. But that perspective is your gateway to get out. You know, having that perspective and going, oh, yeah. Like how freeing is it when you have your first break breakup from real love? You are devastated. You are, and you're like, no, no one understands, and no one's been in love. <laughs> you as don't a, get yeah, it. No, I dare you. Yeah. Even now, I look back on that. That was some high octane emotions. Like they were real emotions. I but now I'm like, you know. you know, it's ridiculous in the scheme of things. Like you just think, come on. Now I'm like, I'm not going to give you the power. Yeah. You now I'm a lot stronger. Exactly. Now I'm like, exactly. Why would I be upset? Exactly. And it's not to say you can't be upset. Exactly. But it doesn't mean that the, you have to put that upset on the, uh, you know, like the be all and end all. And no. also, emotions are temporary. Emotions are temporary. They if we all acted change. in our emotions, and we led them. Mm -hmm. then we would be I heard an ma amazing quote I wish I could know who it was from because I feel bad not even telling it but they said emotions are like your child you <laughs> you wouldn't want them driving your car but you wouldn't stuff them in your boot either why and I was, like, wow, I and I was literally that. crying my eyes out I thought it was hilarious <laughs> and I was like it's so true like you you know take note appreciate them honour them cry mm -hmm. have your moment take your time but it's, it's rare that they're going to be true and I mean that right. it's rare how happy are you sometimes with something? You're like, actually, that wasn't as great as I thought. And it's equal to your sadness. Yes. You know? Um, so true. And happiness thing, things that make you happy change. For sure. I thought like there's certain milestones I would achieve and I'd be like the happiest person in the world. And I'm like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Now I want the next milestone. Yeah. So I think emotions are very temporary. I love that quote. Mm. And even, even emotions with happiness, it's not even so much the happiness that you get from something changes. E you know, I still get really happy if I sat here with you right now and we both ate a whole bag of Maltesers. Oh my God, I would love it. But ultimately, 
that will make me happy, but it's also gonna make me really tired. Probably won't want to do much for the rest of the day. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, even if something does give you happiness, it doesn't give you contentment or put right. you on the path. So sometimes doing the right thing and feeling good ultimately means doing, ignoring those emotions. Yeah. And getting on with it. I love that. We have a closing tradition on this podcast. Oof. Annie Price. Truth or dare? Treat me. Which one? Oh. You have to choose. Oh, I was hoping you were going to like give me a line and I would say truth or dare. <gasps> no, oh, it's truth, or, truth dare. or dare. Shit. Yeah, I was wondering why you were so relaxed about it earlier. You were like, I don't mind that. Well, I don't really want to get up, so I'm going to have to say truth. All right. I'm more intrigued. All right. What's the worst lie you've ever told? Worst lie? Oh, my God. You have to tell me the truth. I'm only having a moment because I literally thought about it the other day. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Let me just let me just have a moment and bring it back. Okay. What's something I've lied about recently? Okay, so this is definitely going to get me in trouble, but it's the only thing I can think of. Is we've just moved into a new house and yeah. the basically the bath. Okay, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I left the bath running. And I was just hanging out with my kids, like playing. Now, in one way, we can look at it that I was, I was, you know, living in my power and and living in presence. Can we just say that I was owning the day and I was being right. a great parent? Yeah, yeah. And I let the bath overrun, and it basically leaked through the floor in your new house into the new house, right? And my husband's like, "What happened? What happened?" And I said, "Oh my god, you know, I can't believe it. The kids have been slashing." It's so terrible. There's water. I said it's like a rainforest down there. So anyway, so the plumber come o- comes over yesterday and he's like, oh, it's just really strange. There's no leak. Because I thought it must have been splashing and leak. I thought it's leaking everywhere. I said it's a leak. Yeah. And he's like, there's no leak in the pipes. I don't know how it would have happened. And there's me like, I don't know. I have no idea. That's crazy, that is. I don't, <laughs> know what's, I don't know what that could have been. And then I had to just lie, uh, you know, I was clutching at straws and I just blamed it on the kids. I said, yeah, the kids were So have you kept this lie up? Yeah. So let's pray your husband and he won't watch this he, podcast. Well, my, kid, my kids definitely won't. Uh, one and four. My They will my when husband. they're like in 20 years time and be like, mum. Screw them. They owe me. I gave birth to both of them naturally without drugs. They owe me some. God, kids, if you are watching, you owe me. You keep your mouth closed. <laughs> that is so funny. But no, my husband won't listen because he's, cheap. he's just he's got short attention. Okay, good. So you won't have got to the end of this podcast anyway, even if you try to. So we're safe. We're safe. We're safe. We're so safe. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks it's for having me. It's been so good to meet you. So lovely to meet you. You're a little dream. I literally can't wait to, you know, watch your career and all the more things you're going to do. Thank I feel you. like you're almost almost wasted behind this camera. I hope you get on TV and <laughs> you do some kind of, yeah, something. It'd be nice One to day. see your face out there. One day. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could press the like, follow and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.